the first year of this series, we went on a 9-1 stretch before losing back-to-back -back games against our rivals, the Pittsburgh Panthers, from our conference, the Big East, and in the Orange Bowl against Virginia Tech, a team we lost against earlier in the year. We did earn a contract extension. Our job security is as high as it can get. Let's see if we can build off of this in year two. In order to do that, we'll have to continue to develop our players, but we have a few already that are NFL Pro ready, such as Owen Schmidt at fullback. He's our highest rated player on the team. Last year, he was sitting at an 86 overall. His speed and strength both improved, something you don't see often. And I personally don't put too much stocks in fullbacks, but he's not a bad blocker. He can block most of the fastest linebackers and even some safeties. You can even hand him the ball from time to time. Only thing that's not very good is his catching and we don't pass enough to worry about that. Dan Moses is the second best player on the team with a 93 overall rating. He was one of only two players last year who was in the 90s club. The other being Mike Lorello who ended up getting drafted by the Green Bay Packers in this past draft. Offensive line is always a priority to me over anything else and even though his strength isn't the highest, his ability to maintain his blocks in the pass and running game is what makes him elite. He will be a senior this year which means this will be his final season with the Mountaineers. Let's try and send them out on a high note. Jason Gwaltney is the third best player on the team with a 91 overall rating. He was a true freshman taking reps in the backup position before an injury forced him into being a starter. He had over a thousand yards on the ground, but he also sustained an injury himself. This season, he needs to prove that he can stay healthy because his skill set is insane. I'm a big fan of the ground and pound approach when the weapons are available. Gwaltney's 97 breaking tackle is a cheat code that needs to be used. Eric Wicks is the fourth best player on the team with a 90 overall rating. This year will be his final season just like Dan Moses. He'll be taking over the position that Mike Lorello had last year. Even though they're closely rated to each other, Wicks is slower and not as quick, but his hands and jumping ability can help him be more of a ball hawk. We'll just have to wait and see at the end of the season who had the better senior year. Jason Coulson is the fifth best player on the team with a 90 overall rating. He had planned on going pro in the offseason, but was talked back into returning to the team for one more year. The senior will be backing up Gwaltney, but I also wanted him to return to help round out his skill set. He's not going to run you over or break your ankles, but he's a reliable player with decent hands and speed. Coulson is a change of pace back in the NFL, but an impact player in the collegiate level. Pat McAfee may not be in the 90s club, but he's an impact player. During the offseason, I decided to change him from kicker to punter. As far as I'm aware of, you only get three impact players, and they gave it to McAfee. You gotta be joking me! If there was one person in the 80s that deserved to be an impact player, it should have been Pat White. He improved by eight points since the start of last season. Both him and Brown improved the most during training camp. I am interested to see which of these two freshmen, Brown and Sowers, will be the starter when White leaves. Behind White, Thompson will continue to be his backup. They share similar skill sets, while Bednarek will be the emergency quarterback if anything were to happen. Either way, I'm confident that the production won't drop off too much with any of these three quarterbacks. There are only two impact players currently on the team, but I can see Gwaltney becoming one during this season. We've already talked about Gwaltney and Colson earlier. I haven't talked about Williams. With Coulson graduating after this season, there's going to be a spot available for the backup spot. Williams already improved by 5 points from the previous season, and even though he wasn't the most improved in the offseason, I wouldn't be surprised if he's near the 90s at the start of next season. We did recruit two new halfbacks to the team, Roland and Jefferson, but they'll be redshirted for their freshman year. We all love Schmitty, but we know he's going to be the starter for the next two seasons. Both him and Deziak both improved by 5 and 4 points respectively. Deziak is a senior and depending on if Schmidt goes pro after this season, we might be left with just the freshman Coley, who will be redshirted his first year. Let's hope that Schmidt returns after this season to give Coley more time to develop. One of the more interesting 
interesting positions is the wide receivers group. Brandon Miles, who led the group, graduated at the end of last season. He wasn't spectacular at all at the position, dropping six passes and having under 500 yards on the year. Most of his workload came at special teams, being the main return man. This year, two players who are entering their final year of eligibility will lead this group. Bolden and Hunter will be the veteran leadership. Bolden did lead the team in receiving yards last season, while Hunter had a good performance as wide receiver number three. These guys will be gone after this season, and it'll be interesting to see if Rivers or Gonzalez will be the next leader at this spot. We're now at a position group that didn't improve. Obviously, we had Josh Bailey graduate last season, and even though Sabre Thomas was redshirted, his off-season training didn't give him a clear edge over Palmer. The choice is still easy to make. He's going to be the starter. He'll have four years to hone in his skills. Palmer will be the backup, and Williams will be redshirted. Last year, Garin Justice won the award for Best Offensive Lineman. He also graduated with his other starting offensive tackle teammate, Garrett. Save Garrett? What's wrong with Garrett? Nothing now. We saved him. Since we were only able to recruit one offensive tackle, Rucker, who will be starting at the right tackle position, I decided to move John Bradshaw from his guard spot to left tackle. They're all still in the first half of their eligibility here with the exception of Davis who's a senior. I think this is a position that's set for the next two to three years. Similar to last season at the tackle spot, the starters at guard are both seniors, Moses and Sheffy. This will be their final year of eligibility, meaning next year Stanchek will most likely take over when he's a junior. He was the most improved at the guard position over training camp. Obviously, with Bradshaw moved over, we're going to have to recruit some new players for this position. Next year will be an interesting time for this offensive line. The three starting interior linemen will be graduating. Jeremy Hines will not be here next season. He's improved so much since the start of last year. Most of it was in-season progression. With a dash of off-season training, we look to be in good shape with Napier behind him, but this is a position that we'll have to focus on with some recruiting. If you're wondering what happened to Moore, I had to cut him to make room for the 70-man roster. He's a senior who wasn't going to beat out the two players in front of him. I figured now's the best time to let him know he's probably not going to make it in the NFL. Focus on your backup plan. Now, I didn't recruit any offensive linemen besides Rucker, and that was in season, and I definitely didn't recruit any defensive linemen. Hunter graduated, leaving us with only three players, and with Young on the way out after this year, we're going to have to scramble to find some young blood to take these spots. We're in the same jam at the defensive tackle position, but that's fine because only Wilson will be graduating this season. We still need to find some depth here through recruiting, but overall I can see this team making a push into the A ranks defensively next year. It may not reflect in the ratings, but I think the outside linebackers improved the most. Obviously, McLee will be leaving after the season, but Hathaway will improve. We have three new players in Wilson, Webb, and Burns that are only going to get better and better. Plus the speed that Wilson has, who's going to start at outside linebacker. I think we're looking really good here. The middle linebackers group didn't change at all in terms of players, and it turned out I had also redshirted Williams last year and I forgot. Doesn't really matter since the two of them didn't really improve, but Hunter will be gone after the season and Magro will be a senior. We'll need to beef up this spot in the offseason. Another position where the ratings didn't change, but we are absolutely better this season in this group. Three freshmen will be starting Griffith, Tolbert, and O'Neal. Nelson is another freshman who will be redshirted. We have five freshmen in total in this spot, and I'm looking forward to how they develop in about two to three seasons, pending if they stay till they're seniors. At free safety, we have two new players, Thomas and Spurlock. Obviously, Jones will be starting this season. He's a senior, and the hope is that either of those players can get some play time to develop for the following season. Spurlock being redshirted, I probably should have redshirted Thomas as well, but I think the idea was to have him some reps since I didn't like how slow Spurlock was, and I'd rather have him develop in the offseason. It's a luxury to have another 90 overall player after Lorello left, and we might get lucky enough to have Malik take over at 90 overall too. 
The hope is that eventually Burton will be a part of the new wave of Mountaineers that guides this team to a national championship in two to three years. He's also redshirted this season. I talked about changing McAfee. I also moved Kozlowski to kicker. The hope is that they both thrive in their new positions. I don't think we need a kicker, but we'll see if he performs well. Obviously, McAfee is the punter. I need to recruit a new one to back him up and learn. That's really what I like about this game. You get better each season, even if you don't play. It's all dependent on how much you invest in training camp. The year is about to go underway and I'll tell you right now, I do feel confident in winning our conference considering we pretty much breezed by all of them except Pittsburgh and we're coming for you. Obviously the Gwaltney isn't going to be in the Heisman watch yet, but so far Peterson is back here along with the Ware. Both Cox and Taylor will be representing Auburn in the Heisman watch this season while Drew freaking Stanton is in consideration. It's just the start of the season. If you saw last year, the only one who remained from the initial five was Peterson, so let's see if he can earn it this year. The season is underway, and like last year, the first week is a bye week, but you probably saw our first two games will be against top 25 teams. Week two and the first game of the year will be against the number 24 ranked Maryland. This seems like a coin toss. Holy smokes, we blew him out of the water, leading 38 to seven at one point. I mean, if this doesn't get you excited for the season, nothing will. Pat White had a four touchdown performance with one interception while Thompson had one pass and one interception? Congratulations! You just proved why you're not the starter. Both Gwaltney and Colson played in this game and Gwalt getting the only rushing touchdown but Colson getting two touchdowns in the air. With that win, we're back in the top 25 for the first time this year but remember, we still have another top 25 team in Texas Tech coming up. On paper, we should win this game, but again, it could be a toss-up. Last week, we were the underdogs. This week, we're not fooling anyone. At one point in the fourth quarter, we were up 17-15, but then the floodgates opened and we couldn't recover. We lost, but against a good team, and uh, I am a bit worried that Pat White was very pedestrian, and Harrell completely destroyed our freshman corners. I think we need to rethink our run-heavy offense, because this was also an issue last season. It's nice that Gwaltney can put up 200 yards, but again, the secondary didn't help. We need a scheme that could fit them, but I won't change that till next offseason since I feel like teams hardly do in-season changes much. Well, it was fun to be ranked for a while. Last year, we lost to Virginia Tech and bounced back. Let's do the same this year. Before we go to the next game, I didn't go over our 12 recruits this year, but one of them doesn't view us very high. Finally, Jonathan Gant has us at the bottom of the list and I did make multiple offers to guards, defensive ends, centers, and wide receivers. Let's just hope we can hit on one of those players. We'll be removing Gant from our list. Tyrone Cohen is another player that had us near the bottom of the list and I decided to move on from him as well. No need to push for players that aren't interested in the program. Third game of the year will be against Western Michigan. They haven't won a game this year yet and their talent is worse than ours. This is a surefire win, right? went up 34-10 before their final touchdown. These are the confident boosting games I long for. One thing I can't help but notice is the 269 yards thrown in the air. I get that we have four turnovers, but why are we giving up so many yards in the air? The secondary is clearly having issues and I can't quite put my finger on it. If it's boom or bust, I can get it, but last week we got busted on pretty hard. Gwaltney with another good performance, a plus five yards per carry game, keeping up the same pace he had last season. Another player from our recruiting class won't be joining our program, Ryan Goolsby, dropped us from his list. The first player of the season to dump us before we can dump them. We're now off to play against Syracuse, and I don't quite understand how they're a B minus, but everything is a C. Should be a win. It was 35 nothing before we got our first points, and uh, 49 to 10 before we had those final two touchdowns. This to me says 
we're not a good team. This has got to be a scheme issue. One incomplete pass and four touchdowns. Our secondary is absolute toast. Get some jam, bring out the butter, whatever way you like it. It's absolutely toasty out there. I understand that we're a run first team. It looks like Waltney was out for the majority of this game, but Colson still performed very well. The scheme is changing next year. It may not be 50-50, but we need to find ways to score points fast because our secondary is just not getting it done this year. Now what's worse? One of our recruits went to our game unannounced. Well, shit. Should I remove him now? Well, after that loss, I'm <laughs> not confident we can beat Rutgers. Our pass defense is being torn to shreds. Okay, we won this week, but it's not like we blew him away, plus another week where we gave up almost 300 in the air. Yep. <sighs> something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but it, there's something wrong, which is a bummer because it takes away from Pat White having a pretty decent game this week. Gwaltney is back with over 200 yards, offensively speaking. We're good, but if we have to get in a shootout, I don't have confidence considering we got railed the last week. To add to this very confusing season, Dan Moses is now out with an injury. It's not too bad since Stanchek is decent depth, but we're in no position to start losing players. Remember when a guard dropped us two weeks ago? Well, another one dropped us this week. Adam Hopkins has dropped us from his list. Looks like a guard. Might be a position I'll be recruiting in the offseason. We've lost only two games all of last season before the bowl game, and it looks like the schedule this year seems to be tougher. We are now playing against Louisville, who has lost the last two games. Can we control this game and force a third straight loss with our number one ranked rush offense? A game that came down to the final few minutes, gave up the lead in the last three minutes, and couldn't recover. Last season was a wild ride but I think we really did regress to the mean. Over 300 yards given up in the air, and this might be the first game where I felt like Pat White gave the game away. Three incompletions, but two of them were interceptions. I'm having second thoughts on White, guys. What's more interesting is that Gwaltney and Colson couldn't finish the game, and Williams ran for over 140 yards. No biggie. Third string running back is as good as our starters. Surprise, surprise. Gwaltney is out for eight weeks. This is the second season that's happened to him, and to be honest, our running backs have been getting injured frequently. I think the scheme is the real reason for that. Uh, we either have to run less or split the carries more. Obviously, we'll be fine at running back with Colson and Williams taking over. While there won't be a drop of quality at the right tackle position, as Basler is about as good as Rucker, just not as strong. On the bright side, finally, one of the guards I was trying to recruit has scheduled a visit with us, and he'll be there for a game against USF this week. We have one of the best rushing games in the nation and the worst passing offense. Same can be said about the defense. Things need to get cleaned up, and hopefully this game against USF is the best chance to start fixing it. We were actually down 20-14 at one point in the fourth quarter, and we only won thanks to a failed two-point conversion. I, I don't don't think things are going to get better this season. 350 yards this week in the air while Pat White carried the team this week. We need to pass. He can do it. Problem is, when we need to cover, the secondary falls apart. Shootouts might be what our season looks like next year with a scheme change, which is going to be a bummer, but Gwaltney can't stay healthy and Colson still managed to get over 100 on a day. It'll be interesting how next year looks. Even after that rough outing by us, Chris Hunter decided he wanted to commit to a team that struggled against USF. At least he's a five-star recruit and will probably start as a true freshman since all our interior starters are graduating. We have a bye this week to try and mentally regroup. We're falling apart, man. We're falling apart. We'll Randall agrees and he dropped us, though to be fair, he's been having second thoughts about us since uh, our embarrassing loss to Syracuse. On the bright side, we scheduled a visit with Terrell Royal for the Cincinnati game. But this week, we take on the one loss, Connecticut. On paper, I feel like we should win. Our strengths are better than theirs. It would also help us in climbing up the conference rankings if we can win. All we needed was a week off to think about how far we've fallen so we can take out our anger and aggression on the next team. Connecticut was that team. 
It was 38 to 7 at one point, but another consistent issue that's been popping up more and more is giving up 300 yards in the air. I'm sure you're tired of me talking about the secondary. Colson had over 200 on the ground. You would think running more would allow for the last time for teams to throw on us. The win helps us stay within a game from the top two spots. If we can finish the season strong, we haven't played Pittsburgh yet. We can still claim the Big East title in back-to-back -back years. We have another player who's scheduled to visit us this week, and that's Scott Rowland. He'll be joining Terrell Royal at the game against Cincinnati. The game on paper should be a win. I'm still very disappointed at how bad this past defense has been, being ranked at 97th, but since Cincinnati barely manages to get 20 points a game. Great. We couldn't even manage to get 20. Yeah, yeah this team isn't good. I, I don't know what happened. Every game we've lost so far, besides Syracuse, has been a close one too. We didn't allow over 300 yards, but Pat White threw an interception. Who knows if that cost us the game. Colson wasn't able to finish, but Williams looked really good in his time on the field. I should just let him start. Huh? That loss really hurts us now. We could have leapfrogged over Pittsburgh and be right behind Connecticut. Instead, we keep getting lower and lower and lower. Even though we lost to a worse team, Scott Rowland decided here is where he wants to be and he'll most likely be redshirted next season, but you never know. Some players weren't too keen on us, like Jared Franklin, he dropped us from his list after that game. Justin Brooks dropped us as well, but we did get a soft verbal from Terrell Royal. I'm on my guard since last year we had a backstabber who committed to Ohio State and we really need a defensive end too. We get another week off pretty quickly, we get to sit in our loss and figure out how bad we really are. Other people get to figure it out too and Danny Larkins decided we're two butt cheeks to join right now. We didn't need him, we had someone better than him and Chris Hunter who committed earlier before our downfall, thank you very much. Well, it's not out of the realm of possibility to come back in the conference but we would have to beat Pittsburgh. Truthfully, I just want to see if we can beat them this year. They were the only team last season in the conference to get a win on us. The story of the season has been close games we've had that ended in losses. This is another one. Managed to come back down 21 nothing, but still lost by a field goal. In the end, we almost gave up 300 in the air and Pat White had another multiple interception performance. Colson continues to show that he can be a star when he eventually goes off to the NFL. Sadly, that loss just put us out of contention for the title. Had we not lost the last two games, we'd be right up top with Connecticut. Instead, we're now fighting to make a bowl appearance now. Remember, last year when a soft verbal player committed to Ohio State? Well, it happened again this season with the Royal. Have I stated that I hate Ohio State. On a more positive note, Anthony Brown will be making a visit to the team. We do need a receiver on the team next year. So far, we've had a guard and a center commit, but no defensive ends thanks to Royals' commitment issues. We're now on to the final game of the year. Can we at least finish with a winning record and a bowl appearance? We're taking on a pretty good Washington State team. We've had a few games this season where West Virginia just blew away the competition, looking dominant in wins, but sticking close and losses. Maybe, maybe next season our luck will fare better. One way to help the odds is to figure out how to slow down teams passing games as we've been picked apart since the start of the year. Colson had his first sub four yards a carry game and I think teams are figuring us out. Starting next season, we'll have to change things up. Here's the final week of the year and then the championship week will begin. And there you go, Connecticut has won the Big East and since we beat them this year, we're the real Big East champs, right? We did get our final recruit to commit to us. Anthony Brown, the four-star wide receiver, will probably get redshirted his first year, but we'll see. I'm not exactly happy with how the season has gone, finishing with a six and five record and a three and four in the conference. If we do have a bowl game, we'll at least have a completely healthy team. Now let's see if we get a bid for a bowl game after this week. We have been chosen to play against the number 11, six and five Texas. How, how, how are they 11? Huh? I don't think they deserve to be 
that highly ranked, but if it means we get to beat a top 25 team in the bowl game, count me in! This year's Heisman winner is Chris Leak. Well, that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Funny enough, no one who was predicted in the Heisman watch at the start of the year even made it the final list. Pat White had a better year stat-wise, but in my eyes, he performed worse. I considered giving him a more heavy workload, but stuck with a run-heavy approach for year two. In year three, I might give him more chances to throw, but this season didn't inspire confidence. Jason Colson was all Big East second team, but wasn't able to finish the season over 1,000. He still has a bowl game to achieve that, but overall he did have a better season on the ground this year. He was also able to stay healthier during this season. Jason Gwaltney, on the other hand, had a down season. Obviously, he was injured and missed half the year, but he's still a sophomore. The run-heavy approach doesn't seem sustainable, and next year we'll have to lighten the load by passing more or splitting carries, or both. If he returns next year, Williams will be the guy who shares the load next year. He's been decent to good when he's had to come in and play. In Rashawn Bolden's final year, he'll be leaving with about as good of a performance than his previous season. We don't throw the ball a lot, but when we do, this boy don't drop. At least as a senior. Joe Hunter is the other senior who's leaving. He had more reps this year and was able to put up a solid season. Is he a pro level player? Nah, but he's a reliable one at the school. Von Rivers will be going into his senior year as the leader of this receiving group. He put up a nice season and I think he's capable of being the guy next year. Sabri Thomas was redshirted last season, but in his first year as a starter on the team, he's done a solid job. After looking at the players we have, I think we can go a bit more pass heavy next season. Sheffy had himself a phenomenal season, only two sacks again, but 30 pancakes. Oh, he was eating well, earned a first team All-American American. Jeremy Hines wasn't as good as Sheffy, but he was a heck of a lot better than he was from last season and even earned a first team All-Big East. John Bradshaw had a better season than last year and considering he's just a sophomore, I expect him to just get better and better. Adam Rucker was great as a true freshman, earned a first team all Big East, and even more impressive, he did it all while missing a few games. We got something special in this kid. Another player that was injured, Dan Moses, still managed to get a second team all Big East. He'll be gone next year along with Sheffy and Hines. This interior line just got a whole lot weaker. Chris Bassler continues to be a good depth player coming in when Rucker was injured and played pretty well. I can see him potentially getting moved if we can't find a better player for the interior line. Ryan Stanchek has had play time his first two years, but next season he'll be starting and I have confidence he'll be able to do the job. The leading tackler on the team is Kevin McLee. He's been an absolute stud the past two seasons, but he'll be gone this year. Seems like a smart idea to have gotten all those outside linebackers now doesn't it? Warren Young will also be gone, but had a decent season starting defensive end. He wasn't a game changer, but he was good enough, led the team in sacks, but that's the sad part of his stat. Jay Henry is another senior who will also be leaving. Had about as good of a season from last year, but able to knock down five passes. Eric Wicks earned a first team all Big East with his performance this season, doing what Lorello did last year, but it'll be interesting to see if he gets drafted higher. I wanted to spotlight the true freshman Jerry Tolbert. He was the second leading player in the interceptions. Clearly, we either need to play more aggressive or focus more on the pass defense. The kicker, Scott Kozlowski, was the new kicker, and it didn't go exactly great, but it did go better than Powell. Speaking of which, he had a pretty good season. Look at that average. Obviously, I would have loved to have a better season, but we just couldn't pull it off in those close games. We at least won one national game, probably the season opener, but our 3-5 and five record versus rivals is something we need to turn around, along with our 1-3 and three record against top 25 teams. I still haven't changed the scheme, that'll be for next year, but what do you guys think? 65-35 with more subbing while we play more aggressively on defense? Hmm? 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 <laughs>
We're off to our bowl game and this Texas defense is basically the opposite of us. We should have a good time running on them, but our defense hasn't been able to slow down some of the worst teams in the air. Let's see how this goes. But wait, there's been an infraction. Pat White has allegedly forged progress reports. This isn't falsifying personal information like last season. This is a big deal. I don't want to do this, but I need to send a message that you can't get away with stuff like this. Even if it turns out it wasn't true, Pat White will be out for the Houston Bowl. The number 11 team, despite their 6-5 record, will be taking on another 6-5 unranked West Virginia in the Houston Bowl. We start at the very first play of the game, McCoy takes the ball, moves to his right, throws deep, and is picked off by West Virginia at midfield. First play after the interception, Thompson is in at quarterback since White is suspended. The pass is tipped and takes a fortunate bounce to a Texas player for an interception who brings it back across midfield for the Longhorns. The strangest bounce you'll ever see, it gets tipped and shoots right into his arms. Two plays later, McCoy is in the pocket, throws to his left, and is picked off again and that's the third combined interception and it hasn't even been a minute yet. We now skip halfway through the first and I'm sure Colson will leave it all out on the field during his final game with the Mountaineers. A few plays later, even with White out, the team can still run the read option perfectly with Thompson in the lineup. Their skill sets are very similar. The drive has been eating up a lot of clock in the first. Colson with the carry, runs over a defender, has space, past the first and into the red zone. He gets over 1,000 yards rushing on the season and with that carry, he'll get inside the five and he keeps pushing and scores the first touchdown in the game and I thought he'd leave it all out on the field and he has. Texas hadn't gotten the best start to the game in the air, but maybe they just need a jump start from their running game. Getting them across midfield, later on third down, same drive, McCoy finds Taylor again, this time in the air for the first down. Another third down on the same drive, McCoy with plenty of time in the pocket, but throws into traffic, forcing a fourth down. They decide to go for it instead of kicking a field goal at the 31. McCoy under pressure going deep to the end zone and is picked off for the third time. Story of the season was how bad this pass defense was but so far they've been shutting down the passing game today. West Virginia would do nothing with the ball handing it back to the Longhorns and on the first play of the drive McCoy going deep finds his guy to tie it up at seven. He had great protection but an even more impressive throw 60 yards for the score. We saw how impressive Colson was on his last run on second and 16 after he sack spins out of a tackle and gets the first down. The fear was with Pat White out the passing game would struggle, but Thompson has been serviceable so far, finding Bolden here for the first. Near midfield on third down, protection holds up, giving Thompson time to find Gwaltney wide open down the middle to get them into field goal range. They would run the clock down to 33 seconds in the half, attempting a 43-yarder. Kozlowski puts it up, and they regain the lead 10-7. With only 20 seconds now in the half, Texas has the ball. They threw three interceptions so far in this game. McCoy throws it deep into double cover and it's caught. He takes it the rest of the way and just like on their last drive, all it took was one play and I'll be honest, I think it was the same play. We skip to halfway through the third, Longhorn still up 14-10 thanks to those two long touchdown passes and make it a third on the day and this one wasn't even thrown as far, but it was taken as far. 69 yards to the house and that's the third touchdown for Swede. Gave so much praise for the secondary in the first quarter, but have been toast ever since. Mountaineers just trying to get some points on the board and Thompson squeezes this one in to Gwaltney to get them inside the 30. It would only lead to a field goal attempt, but making it would cut it down to a one score game. The kick is up, has the distance, and it's good. It's now 21-13 going to the fourth. Fast forward to the final two minutes. West Virginia has the ball and Colson is carrying it to extend the drive. They got their first touchdown on the back of the running game. Looks like they're trying to tie it, doing the same thing here. Colson fighting his way near midfield. It's now third down. They abandon the running game. Thompson has time. The rows over the middle and the redshirt freshman Sabre Thomas can't hold on to it. Incomplete. The game will come down to this fourth down. Thompson moves to his left, trying to buy as much time as he can, but he doesn't even throw it, eats the sack, and is turnover on downs. 
at this point, all the Longhorns need to do is run out the clock. They hand it off here, sweep left side, and easily gets the first down. The next play, they hand it off to the fullback, who makes a move and easily gets the first down here too. I think it's safe to say the game is over. One timeout left by the Mountaineers, and they can't even make a tackle until he gets inside the five. On first and goal, they hand it off, and forcing his way through the defender, but brought down at the one. They couldn't punch it in the first time, but the second time they get it in, and it's pretty much over. The Mountaineers are playing for pride at this point, unless they make a miracle comeback. Thompson is under pressure, throws, and it's picked off. Nobody's going to stop him, and that's the nail in the coffin. For the second straight year, the Mountaineers lost in a bowl game, and this year it wasn't even close. Pat White being out might have played into the outcome. But the secondary continues to be boom or bust, and they boomed in the first quarter, and they busted for three. That's going to be it for the video. No off-season in this one. I figure it might be better to do it in the next one. See you all in year three.